So in the first part we heard where Claude Donnier came from and how he became a very capable engineer. In this episode we want to discover his work at the Zeppelin design office. He started working at the Zeppelin factory in Friedrichshafen on 2nd of November 1910. Working hours were now 8 hours per day and Saturday afternoon was free. So that was an improvement to before. He worked in the newly founded research department. The situation of the Zeppelin company was tricky. They had a huge budget from the donation of the German people who were excited about this new technology, but the Zeppelin engineers also saw that regular airship service wouldn't be possible without hangars. And if the wind is not exactly blowing into the hangar's direction, it was almost impossible to bring the large Zeppelin in without damage. So internally there were two different opinions. The Zeppelin design office said the only way to solve this would be to have hangars which you can turn into the wind. But that would make them very expensive and complicated. Graf Zeppelin himself was convinced that they wouldn't need the expensive hangars but that the airship's hull should be reinforced so it can be properly fixed on the ground and resist thunderstorms. Because of that internal argument, Graf Zeppelin created the research department to analyze this question. And because of that, they came back to Donier and employed him, the experienced static engineer. So when Donier started at the Zeppelin design office, he was confronted with this problem and he had meetings with Graf Zeppelin himself who explained his zeppelins and the hangar problem to him. Donier promised him to give his best and set to work. But when he realized how the zeppelins are designed and how little weight the massive hull is allowed to have to still be able to fly, he could see that the reinforcement Graf Zeppelin demanded wasn't possible. When he told Graf Zeppelin, he was furious. He said, you just don't want to do it, just like Du. Du was the lead engineer who designed all Zeppelins from LZ2 to LZ130. He was an empirical engineer and less a man of science. When Donier told him about his structural calculations of the Zeppelin's hull, he raged at Donier, we don't need any calculations. You do 100 Zeppelin flights first before you discuss with us. And in general, this whole new research department that Graf Zeppelin created to avoid expensive hangars wasn't received well by the rest of the company. Until now, they designed Zeppelins based on their previous experience, and by they, I mean mostly young engineers that Dürr hired from the mechanical engineering school in Esslingen, the same university he graduated from. And now, suddenly, a new generation of young engineers came into the company, influencing their design by calculations, like Donier. So, he was like an alien in the design office. Every employee who wanted to get close to the airship needed to be signed off by lead engineer Dürr. And so people of the research department had a couple of difficulties. Since Graf Zeppelin himself brought Donier into the company and was his mentor, he gave him a permanent permission to enter the hangar. Donier also participated in a lot of test flights where he could conduct experiments and take measurements. As before, Donier was always at work and totally committed. He spent hours in the hangar looking at the airship's frame and climbing through the hull. His final conclusion was that the reinforcement for the hull would not be possible. So the rotating hangar would be the only solution. And while he was sitting in the Zeppelin, he got the idea to create a hangar with a fixed ground and rotating cover, instead of rotating the whole building including foundation. That way, the hangars would be much cheaper because they would just have a standard foundation. The new Zeppelin CEO Koltzmann founded a lot of small companies around the Zeppelin technology. He founded the DELAC, the first commercial airline in the world, to earn money with Zeppelins. He founded the Maybach engine factory to supply engines exclusively for the needs of Zeppelins. He founded the Zahnradfabrik, in short ZF, to supply gearboxes for Zeppelins, until today one of the largest gearbox specialists in the world. And he founded the Zeppelin Hangar Company to concentrate on solving the rotating hangar issue. So when Donier had his idea of the simple rotating hangar, he presented it to Hugo Eckner first, head of the airline DELAC and later the successor of Graf Zeppelin. He was very happy about Donier's invention because it could solve so many problems of him. 
Graf Zeppelin was also very impressed and happy about Donier's idea, although he didn't reinforce the Zeppelins like he wanted it. But much cheaper rotating hangars meant the problem was gone. Zeppelin pushed that the Zeppelin Hangar Company in Berlin should build Donier's design, and the German Defense Office held a design competition for the best rotating hangar at that time. Donier's design won against all the other big names in German steel industry. At that time, Donier earned 250 Goldmark per month and had a couple of Goldmark in his account. Remember, he still had to pay for five family members and two flats. Now, the prize money for the hangar competition was 80,000 Goldmark and Graf Zeppelin insisted that this prize money should be paid out to Donier directly. So, suddenly, he wasn't just a rich man, Zeppelin also gave in his own department within the Zeppelin company, the legendary Department Do. So, just to summarize that, because you find the situation very often in an engineering career. Donier came into the company, into a department which wasn't popular. He had a new idea which was completely against what the company did so far, and the people around him didn't support him. But he showed his idea to the top management and found people who supported him. That way he bypassed the negative lower structure and in the end he got the prize money, fame and his own department. Please remember that if you have a great idea in your company. So Donier had his own design office, his own workshop and his own staff now within the Zeppelin company. He experimented with the main beams of the Zeppelin structure and tried to make them lighter and stiffer. His idea was to crimp the edges of the small elements that connect the beam. That way, the beam got a lot stiffer without adding any weight. Graf Zeppelin was very interested in Donier's experiments and visited him quite often. When he brought lead engineer Dürr to watch the test, the only thing he said was, with crimping we cannot connect the elements properly. But he must have been impressed because shortly after all Zeppelin beams had the crimping. Donier also investigated new, more efficient metal propellers for the airships. And here his French background was an advantage. He had contact with the French engineer Auguste Rateau, a specialist for propeller and turbines. He adapted his propeller concept for his Zeppelin projects and when he visited him in Paris, he also met Gustave Eiffel, the famous French engineer who designed the Eiffel Tower and had lots of experience with stiff metal structures. And by the way, his ancestors came from the German region Eiffel, the area which later became famous for the Nürburgring. So Eiffel also designed his own wind tunnel to measure aerodynamic forces on wings. He showed Donier around and he left deeply impressed. At the same time, Graf Zeppelin came very often to Donier to discuss future plans for his airships. His idea was to build a Zeppelin that can cross the Atlantic and reach New York. And this is years before the First World War. Graf Zeppelin gave Donier the task to design such an airship from a clean sheet of paper. So a parallel development in Donier's research department to the standard design process. Based on what he learned in Eiffel's wind tunnel, Donier designed a Zeppelin with an aerodynamic teardrop shape instead of the long cylindrical shape of Zeppelins at that time. Graf Zeppelin himself was not an aerodynamicist, but he told him to change the tip of the hull because he said it needs to be sharp to cut through the air. He knows that from his previous army experience. Check out my other video for more information on Graf Zeppelin's life. He said, if he pushed his sword with the sharp side in front through the air, it's easier than the other way around. Anyway, as you can imagine, lots of people were jealous of Donier. Graf Zeppelin liked him and spent lots of time with him. People said because he only tells Zeppelin what he wants to hear and supports him in his crazy ideas. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Donier always had to bring Graf Zeppelin back to reality and tell him what's not possible. So he was pretty often pretty angry with Donier, but he always supported him. One little side story. One time, Graf Zeppelin and Donier bumped into each other in Berlin and took the same train back to Friedrichshafen. After the long discussions in the train, Zeppelin said, we will see us shortly, I will visit you in your office. When Donier said he would like to go home now and say hi to his family, Zeppelin got angry and said, what is it with you young people? You will have enough time for family later, but now we have big things to achieve. Does that sound familiar? 
And when Donnier asked for a week holiday to get married, you can imagine how that went. In summer 1913, when tensions between Germany and France were increasing, Graf Zeppelin came to Donnier and said, Donnier, you're French. Yes, I never said I wasn't. You cannot work here anymore if you are French. Would you be willing to get German citizenship? Donnier couldn't really say no. So Donnier wrote to the French consulate in Munich. They knew him well because he never responded to any of their letters telling him to do his mandatory military training for the French army. And later he was injured at his arm so he couldn't join. Anyway, they told him they cannot decide it and he needs to write to Paris directly. After a while, Paris came back to him saying that it's not possible to change French citizenship. He showed the letter to Graf Zeppelin and he used his contacts in German politics. Shortly after, Donnier received a letter from German authorities saying that he is now officially a German citizen. He was wondering about how quickly that worked and only realized much later that they just quickly made him a German citizen without contacting the French side. Later he realized he has two citizenships. And this dual nationality was a burden for him during his whole life. In Germany he was a former Frenchman and in France he switched sides to the Germans. In summer 1914 the First World War started and Graf Zeppelin immediately traveled to Berlin to get the latest news and advocate for Zeppelins. The German army decided that Zeppelins are not useful for war and handed all their airships over to the German navy. Their task was to attack Britain with these Zeppelins. So now the planned new army Zeppelin hangars in east and west were not needed anymore and also the new Zeppelin to cross the Atlantic was put on hold. Graf Zeppelin came to Donnier and said, right now, when we cannot develop our Zeppelins further, we shouldn't just rely on Zeppelins. Planes are the future and you need to design one for me, that can carry a 1000 kg bomb to the London docks. So in summer 1914, Graf Zeppelin himself already realized that planes are the future and he demanded a plane that can carry a 1000 kg bomb at a time when planes looked like this. And Another little side note, planes were so new that the German word Flugzeug wasn't even invented yet. It was created later by Professor Bendemann in Brandenburg. So in that situation, Donnier, still an employee at the Zeppelin factory with his own department, was suddenly confronted with the task to build a large long-range plane. In the next episode, we want to take a closer look at how exactly he approached this task. If you want to support this channel, become a B-Sport Club member to make videos like this one possible. See you at the next one.